All right. Thanks, Scott. Hello. Hello, Jamie. You're coming through loud and clear. I hope I am as well. For the most part, yes, good enough. <laughs> for the most part, I love that. For, 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 for being on the dark side of the moon in a small town in Texas, you're doing fine. All right, all right. So, you know, hopefully those of you who were here last uh, Monday, I was uh, even, uh, well, let's just say my connection wasn't that good. I, I think I've got my connection uh, problems remedied. So knock on wood, uh, the, statistic, or the, uh, the technology gods are on my side today. Um, so just want to take, a, take the time to welcome everybody to another edition of the Office Hours webinar with myself and Mr. Steve Gomez, coming to you with about, uh, I don't know, just shy of 50 years experience between the two of us. Um, so before we get started with the fun stuff today, just want to take time to do the legal, uh, little bit of legal uh, disclaimer here. I just want to make everybody aware that Trade Ideas, our crew and ourselves, we're here to educate you guys. So please do not take what we say here today as a solicitation to um, buy or sell securities. If you do need that type of service, plenty of people to go to, registered investment advisors, registered brokers, things of that nature. So once again, we're just here to uh, help you guys with some education on how to use the tools and find good setups. And that is that. Okay. So pretty much got the same compulsory in line today. However, as all of you know, boy, the past couple of market days, Friday compiled with this one, not your average market days. Um, very, very far from average. Um, a lot of macroeconomic news in there, uh, making things uh, just very uncertain at this point in time. And, uh, you know, I'm no fortune teller, um, but it looks like things are going to be uncertain for the remaining short term. You know, who, who knows how long this Brexit uh, is going to be affecting the markets. So, you know, I guess we should probably start off with a little bit of that action. Take a look at the sky here. Steve, let, uh, yeah. let you apply your expertise to the charts that we're looking at here. And, you know, definitely today is going to be a little bit different uh, than, than most of the webinars that we do because just things are so out of the ordinary. The charts are broken. Uh, we talk a lot about how, well, maybe we haven't talked a lot, but um, when, a, when a stock gets uh, hammered on really bad earnings, usually you have that horrible first day down, that gap down. And it's one of my hard and tried and, and, and tested rules to not jump in and try and buy a stock after it's been hammered on a gap down of earnings, it usually takes a few days to work that out. So what we're kind of going on the same vein here is the market got hammered on the Brexit news. And just being able to jump right in and buy the, the lows of Friday was not a good idea. There's still a lot more that needs to be unwound here, a lot more digestion that needs to go on. Matter of fact, sometimes I even say I don't even want to touch a stock after bad earnings to the long side again until it's had at least three days of churning and burning and, and working out all that indigestion. So, you know, what uh, what Jamie just said here is is true. We still are expecting a little more uh, churning and some more digestion. Um, today we did close off the lows, but still, you know, there was a lot of follow through over the weekend and the volatility is still here and it's probably going to remain here for at least a few more days. And so um, there's just not much we can do about that. A lot of charts broke along with the market. This market took down a lot of charts. And uh, we will touch on Holly later in the uh, broadcast, but there were zero trades taken on Friday by Holly. She saw that mess and said, no, thank you. And then today, it was very sparingly. It took almost an hour, I think, before the first trade did show up today, but still a, a low trade frequency count for our AI. Um, let's zoom out a little bit and look at these uh, bigger pictures because we still have this range uh, to deal with here. Um, well, actually, we did break down below uh, the, uh, the the prior range, and now we're we're looking at a new level that, uh, that Jamie just drew in there, um, which probably would make sense on that uh, little hitch from that wick going back. Um, you know, the market was uh, the spiders, I should say, were fighting very hard to to defend the 200 uh, level price level psychological level big round number, but um, we did flush down below those prior um, orange lines that we've had drawn for a few weeks now, uh, breaking the downside uh, trading range to the downside. So 
uh, that being said, we really have to be um, on guard for more continued selling and just try and look like uh, he drew there where the next level of support may be. Uh, there could be a decent case for, you know, I don't want to call it, but there's, you know, they don't call it turnaround Tuesday for nothing. Uh, a lot of times after volatility, you have a horrible Monday, but then you get maybe a little bleed through into Tuesday, and then uh, there's been, you know, there wouldn't be an axiom named after it if it wasn't, you know, somewhat true. Uh, Tuesdays can sometimes portend uh, some decent rebound days, so it's quite possible we could see that tomorrow, but today we're still looking at a gap down, big old red candle, more additional percentage losses, and we have taken out the lower end of that trading range that we were working on for the longest time up there around uh, uh, 206 and then uh, even some more below it. So, you know, here we are. Um, charts are broken. We got to really dial back our share size. That's one of the ways we've talked about dealing with volatility. You can still make some decent moves on the right side if you've got small shares, but it protects you uh, for volatility when it goes against you. Um, what are your thoughts, Jamie? you have any? <laughs> I do have a little bit of thought, Steve. I think I used them all up throughout the trading day today, but yeah, you know, okay. fortunately, I uh, I made notes in the form of lines across my chart here. So you know, said the charts are broken, for lack of a better description. Um, in other words, all bets are off. You know, I was catching up on news over the weekend. A lot of the exchanges are widening their volatility, like uh, envelopes or thresholds on the options exchanges. So. Nobody knows what in the world is going to happen, and of course, we're never in the prediction business. We are in the reactionary business. So, you know, looking at the chart right here, um, obviously this <laughs> this very long wick was Friday's action, and here we go today. Um, so, <clears throat> when the market turns into a beast such as this, it's all about how quickly can we sum up what might be going on and figure out where to spend our time. Right? So, you know, before we get into examining Holly's trades today, um, you know, uh, statistically speaking, there is a whole lot of noise right now. So, you know, once again, we have to try to rely on our early warning system. And, you know, the CCW here stands for Compare Count Window. And boy, was it very eye opening today. And what do I mean by eye-opening? After the first 20-30 minutes, and I, of course I hope everybody can see that. It's a little bit blurry. There we go. It's a little bit larger now. Um, but this was pretty much what my compare count readings were, not only in the first 20-30 minutes, but even when I would reset it and just to see if the tide was turning at all. I mean, it was just buried in the red. All right. So first and foremost, that's huge. And that's your first impression on the day right there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and for those of you who attend regularly and have heard Steve and I uh, speak about these compare count windows in the past, just to refresh everyone's memory, you know, a clear-cut bias is typically, typically when you get 60% one way or the other. And I always like to say when you see 70 plus, <clears throat> that's one of those days. And what do I mean by one of those days? Well, depending on market conditions, there's typically only maybe one to four of those trading days every month where there's just a huge you know, bias to one side or the other. And of course, I never like to use the term easy when it comes to trading, but those days are easier uh, than most. Now, when you see metrics of 80% plus and even pegging out into the 90 percentile, that is definitely something that you need to pay attention to. And, you know, it's quite ironic because a few weeks ago we were just talking about, well, you know, the past few summers have not been your typical summers. And boy, you could say the same thing for good old June now. I mean, wow. I mean, one would think that we're, we are in the fall because typically in the past it seemed like the big moves always happen in the fall. Everybody just wants to cruise through the summer, but not the case this time. Um, some of the most volatile markets we've seen in a very, very long time. So that leads us to the next point here. Statistical variances. And once again, for those of you who attend regularly and for, you, for the people who are CI subscribers uh, at the present time, um, our girl Holly is our statistical model. 
that trades each and every day with statistical probability on her side. Now, the more volatile the market gets, the more statistical noise there, there will be uh, to accompany that. So, a very good analogy here, and you know, once again, people who attend regularly have heard this story before, so bear with me. Uh, I'm going to throw a little bit of a new twist on it, which I hope resonates with everybody today. And for those of you who are new, I hope this explains uh, clearly uh, what the statistical model's expectations are. So when we're dealing with statistical variance, all the time we talk about how Holly is trading just like a professional card counter in Vegas would play blackjack, right? Knows how to assign values to the face cards, the tens, and, and the kings, and the queens, and the jacks, and keep a count. So if he's good at it, if he or she is good at counting cards, then they know when the, dot, the deck is going to get hot, meaning there's a lot more face cards in there than things at nine or lower. And through pushing their bets at the right time and getting the dealer to bust, they can consistently win. Of course, we all know that if you get caught doing that in the blackjack, uh, at blackjack in a casino, they will promptly escort you out, and you're lucky if that's all they do. Mm -hmm. um, but the good thing about the market is they can't keep us from counting cards. As long as we've got the methodology and the data behind us, we can count, 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 and benefit, benefit, benefit. However, you know, an interesting correlation would be this. Let's say today was not like today. Let's say the summer was shaping up like a lot of other summers in the past. Maybe we gap up just a smidge, maybe a quarter point. Maybe we gap down a quarter point on the spies. Maybe we open flat. But really, if the gap is insignificant, then we're pretty much playing with this deck over here on the left. And as you can see here, of course, Steve, I can't eyeball that, but it looks like there might be two or three decks in this. At least case. two, no more than three, yeah. Right, right. So the thing with blackjack is you will be hard-pressed to go to Vegas and find a casino that's dealing one deck blackjack. Maybe if you go down onto the, uh, you know, get away from the strip and go downtown, you know, maybe, maybe you'll find a casino doing that, which it makes it a lot easier to count cards. Now you throw two or three decks in there, then your card counting is getting more and more difficult. <clears throat> and a long time ago, casinos started using six deck shoes to make it harder on the card counters. Well, everybody adapts and, you know, it's really not that difficult to count cards out of a six deck shoe if you focus on it and really apply yourself and learn to do that. Well, then they started folding in, you know, maybe unlimited decks, or they use a six deck shoe, but they reshuffle the cards after every hand is played, therefore making it virtually impossible for anybody to count cards because they're mixing everything up over and over again. So today is definitely one of those days where you're playing with six or more decks in the shoe and everything's reshuffled after every hand. So a statistical model is not going to have as much success in this type of environment. So, you know, I've thought about doing this as just setting up a little sliding scale about if the gap is this, then expect this. If the gap is this, expect this. So with the volatility and the gaps that we've been ex uh, experiencing here lately, statistical models don't hold up as well. So that leads us back to the point of Holly. Once again, we also say that Holly was never designed to be a black box but she's just another high quality window, like an alert window, or a compare count window, or a price limit alert window. So really the key is, which windows should we focus on, on a day like today, or a lesser volatility day, or a day with no gap? So the statistical model is going to be the best when we have small gaps and good compare counts right off the bat. Now, today was not that day. So let's take a look at what Holly did. A relatively low trade count today, one, two, three, four, and five. So we had one of each of these guys fired. We had five from Bond Shorty today. After everything was said and done, Holly lost 89 cents on those nine trades. And we can see 
of the five trades that bond shorty. That was pretty much where uh, where the you know the negative trades came from. A little bit here uh, on the net. Or excuse me, that's non-exit profit. So when we look at the close, where did my close go? There it is, right there. So we can see negative buck sixty-one, eighteen cents here, nine and five and forty respectively. Of course, this was the little guy that got spat out in the last hour, the power hour long, DPS. And I gotta say, you know, DPS going into the close gets the signal. You know, you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, <laughs> buying into uh, this stock at highs close to the close, but guess what? It still works. Can you go to a 15 minute? Can you switch to 15 minute on that? Because one of the things that stuck out in my mind was for those and for those of you in the live trading room, the red bar ignored. Um, mm -hmm. There was a, there was a nice early red bar ignored in there just below that, that first red bar, as a matter of fact. So that was interesting, and that kind of gave me uh, a little bit of confidence that maybe this thing was going to continue to trend a bit more. And uh, Looks like it did, but for those not familiar, the red bar ignore is a pattern recognition uh, that's used a lot in the live trading room and is also a function of trade ideas. He's highlighting it right there. The uh, premium, RBI and GBI, red bar ignored, green bar ignored, part of the premium service, which is a pattern recognition that basically looks for green bars in a row, minimum of four, if it throws a red bar in there, and that red bar is overcome by another green bar with a continuation of the trend, those can be very uh, powerful continuation type moves. And so, um, yeah, I, I looked at this when it came out and said, boy, it sure has had a nice run. But one thing I did notice is it had that red bar ignored thing going on. So didn't really uh, have too much pullback at all. And it looks like it made a few cents. Indeed it did. And it'll be interesting to watch this one, you know, tomorrow because uh, we're talking about Dr. Pepper Snapple, right? Um, popping just above these uh, resistance levels on the you know, on the daily, will it uh, continue? You know, it looks like it did expend quite a bit of energy today, but we'll see tomorrow. Definitely one to keep an eye on, I'd say. All right, so let's get back over here to Ollie, and let's just take a look at the all trades plotter, which I have pulled up right here, and we can see if I sort by close profit how she did on each and every trade today. Best winning trade was that one at the very end off our hour. Worst trade was a short in MAN, um, so about 28 and 40 cents. And you know, on a typical day where Holly, you know, uh, has a, a decent winning day or even a losing day on her net P&L, the non-exit profit typically, you know, shows us some pretty interesting stuff. Um, today, there's not a whole lot uh, to point out other than the CDXC. Right, which was a nice average. percentage, which was a nice percentage winner because again, I'll, I, I'll go on record as saying I really take a second glance at all the Holly trades that come in under five because the ones that work usually seem to work pretty well and have some decent uh, non-exit profit percentage wins behind them. So again, the idea generation is where the value is. How you manage the trade is up to you. She got out on a time stop early, but as we always say, if it's a time stop and the trade is green and pushing through highs, is there really a reason you need to get out too? Or maybe consider selling a half or one third and uh, booking some profits and then letting the rest of it run. And uh, in this case, you know, the under $5 stock again had some more run in it. So it finished up the day, I think almost 4% or so on the, uh, you know, total, uh, total alpha that was uh, generated from the open. Right. So the enterprise was 302. At the top, 325 was the high. You know, probably, you know, anybody that followed Holly into this trade could have milked a little bit more out of it, just putting the trader's hat on and going, you know, as we always say, there's no reason to get out. Holly has to get out. That's what she's going to do every time. Um, but everything else looks pretty much in line. Um, you know, the reduce risk, new functionality that we've implemented along with the profit safe uh, seems to have done its job, about 28 versus about 48. Um, this one was kind of a flip-flop. So, you know, other than the CDXC trade around, you know, just a pretty non-eventful day for Holly, but when we look at the volatility and the gaps, not that big of a surprise, right? So, you know, on days like today, we have to figure out, okay, what tool is going to be best for us, right? So for a carpenter, and, you know, we need to, uh, you know, screw in a wood screw, we're not necessarily going to take out the hammer to beat that thing 
home. All right, we're gonna we're gonna use a little bit more finesse. So you know, really, what I'd like to showcase today is the price alert window. And so here it is, right here. And by the way, all of these were set today by myself. And <clears throat> an interesting little uh, scenario unfolded. So just to kind of take you through my mindset, all right, what was I really focusing on today? Did I know what was going to happen? No, but I could kind of estimate and go, okay, if these levels are hit, then this is where I'd like to get into some action here. And I'm just going to pop this back over to uh, the five minute. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, when a day like today unfolds, Yes. Yeah. Talk Sorry. about talk about information overload. I mean, it's really easy just to get swept away by the data on days like today because there's so much going on. Um, but considering the fact that Holly was quite silent uh, in the first hour or so, um, this is what I was looking at. So of course we see where the spy closed. You know, on Friday, gap down, and here's where we opened. So let me just try to make this a little bit bigger here. So here's the opening bar today, all right? So in the first 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes, we're down here, we're putting our bottoms on that first wick, and then look at the action on these candles. We can see, you know, here, try to whoosh back up. Sellers, I mean, buyers tried to take control. Nope, got pegged, back, pegged right back down. Once again, up, down, so four different times. It's like that game whack-a-mole. They stuck their head up, some guy whacked them with a mallet, went right back down. We can see these high wicks, and as we all know, those are very short moves, and they tell us something. So as soon as I started seeing this, I'm like, okay, being the range break guy that I am, if we break below here, and that's where I first drew my line, which that was the limit alert, as soon as we punched through, that was, that was the way that I was going to go. Now, I first bracketed. I first bracketed the S&P because, once again, I don't know what's going to happen. I can only react. So I put my brackets in right here, and I'm like, okay, one thing that I feel very confident about today is that we're not going to stay in this little range. We might pop up. We might pop down. But that was the first step in my process, establishing my bracket. Then this side of the bracket took hold, and, you know, the rest is pretty much history. So, you know, First and foremost, the spy is the head of the snake. You know, even things that aren't part of the S&P get pulled around by the magnet. It is the S&P 500. The so, spy is not looking too good after hours either, are they? No, it's not. It's not. Um, and that that brings up another. Well, I'm not even going to get into that, Steve. I was going to talk about that cross bid and offer, but eh, interesting yeah. but irrelevant at this point in time. Um, but just on the spy alone, ladies and gentlemen, you know, my entry here. Uh, what we had just above 200, 200.30. And of course, at the bottoms, you know, we had exit potential of not quite two points. But on the SPY, that's a pretty darn good trade. All right. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, I put on a few more shorts as well. So, you know, and these were all based on a couple of other windows that I have on my desktop. <clears throat> One is the volume radar. Another one was uh, the good old-fashioned turbo breaks down, right? So those also pointed me to some other guys that were shaping up like the spy. And, you know, for example, this little guy had already broken down, but once again, once we see this little area right here being breached, you know, it took a little bit longer for this one to materialize. So what I tried to do is stack myself with some good short plays that look like they might turn out well, coupled with some long plays as well. Now, when did I start putting on long plays? Well, some of this may, this may, you know, a lot of people may go, oh yes, I remember last time when you spoke about this. So the SPY is already working for me. I tack on a couple of other shorts that are working as well. But then this happens. We come down here, we can't go any lower. We get the wicking action again. We start to pop back up. And you don't have to peg it at the bottom, ladies and gentlemen, but you can react. So, you know, 15 minutes later, we're up here. I'm thinking to myself, okay, the spice put in a bottom here. Is it going to hold? Well, maybe, maybe not. But the head of the snake has moved nonetheless. 
So what I did is I simply went to my, let's see if I have it here, if I don't have it up, I can certainly spawn it. So let me do that real quick here while I locate my toolbar. There we go. I was on a 12 inch screen last Monday, I'm back on a 23 inch, I still don't have enough room, but that's what happens to traders. Okay. So at this point in time, I'm seeing this buy bounce. And I'm wondering, okay, well, the goal here is to basically set up a miniature hedge fund based on how many ever positions I feel are appropriate, which today, I believe 10 triggered, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 10 positions today at the close were up to 357. Now, closing out things, managing my profits, managing my stop losses, tightening those down, there's more than what you see here, just like with Holly. What we see here, a lot of the times, is nothing compared to what we see in the non-exit column. This is kind of the opposite. It's where you got out of some of your stuff. But the interesting thing to point out is with uh, several longs, four shorts and six longs on the blotter today, mm -hmm. it's pretty much stayed the same and increased due to the ebbs and flows and what was moving. And so that's really the game that was played today here. You take some shorts, you take some longs. When things cycle up, cycle up and cycle down, then you have the opportunity to roll out of a profit and close those positions or even switch directions. So what did I do to find these longs that were never up real huge today, but when the ebbs and flows kicked in, it was nice to see this P&L kind of staying static or going up. It was, it was hovering right around two bucks, 250 most of the day. <clears throat> when we came back down, we got a nice little pot because the shorts were definitely outperforming uh, the longs, which is what the compare count was telling us all day. And even though that's what was happening underneath the carpet, we're still going to have our knee-jerk reactions and our bounces and our, our little seesaw action here. The seesaw is always in motion. So to find these longs, what did I do? After we were about right here on the spine, and that was, let's see here, 10.35 my time, and I'm on Pacific time now. So all I did is consult my volume radar at that specific point in time. So if we go back and just kind of set the historical data here. And of course, I might not hit it right on the head, but just to give you guys an idea of the methodology behind the madness here, <clears throat> now we're looking at what the list looked like central standard time between 10.30 and 10.35. So I'm looking at this, I'm going, okay, SPY's put in a bounce. We all know every stock, even if it's in the S&P, doesn't react immediately. So then all I had to do, and on this one, I think I had myself looking at about 500 stocks on the list. By the way, we can take this list, any top list, up to 1,000 stocks. So it was as simple as this. I sort to show me stocks not at their highs, the stocks that were close to their low or at their low at that point in time. At which point in time, all I had to do was go through and find the ones where the volume was drying up well below normal on the one, the five, and the ten minutes. And just to refresh everyone's memory, a value of one is normal for these time frames. So I picked three or four that looked really good, or six in this case. And, you know, basically it was just about sizing them up, where they were in their position, had they started the bounce yet, and if so, by how much. The low is going to help us establish our stop loss. And, you know, um, of course this would have been more of an appropriate time today. So, you know, even if you played it right here, you got a little upside movement here. Because when volume is exhausted, and by the way, if we look at all my notes right here. I went through and I, you know, made notes on why I'm entering that long trade. Volume depletion, volume depletion, volume depletion, volume depletion. Now this little guy right here that closed up, five cents on the day, Steve, this happens to be our trade of the week as well. How about that? Yeah. So, 
<clears throat> you know, when things are crazy in the market, the best thing you can do is take a step back, make sure you have some quality metrics that you're going to be focusing on, and wait for the trades to come to you. You know, I can't tell you how many people uh, on my Twitter feed today were reiterating the same methodology. Many different phrases were used, um, but the overall message was the same. When it's crazy out there, <clears throat> unless you, you know, you have a plan and you let the trades materialize, there's no point in chasing or feeling like you're going to miss out on something because, as we always say, the missed money is much, much better than lost money uh, any, any given day. So just from putting on, you know, 10 trades, which weren't that crazy, and as I always like to say, if you can draw some horizontal lines, you're halfway there. Now you couple this with some of the other tools that we have. You know, you can bet your bottom dollar today that I was really paying a lot of attention to this window right here as well. Letting me know that, you know, once I got into this trade and it penetrated and seeing the volume levels of right at 300, which is the minimum I like to see while this penetration was, was being made, it makes you feel nice and happy as a trader, you know. <laughs> Be the confidence that you need keeps you in that rational state of mind, which, by the way, most of the time, Steve and I are, you know, uh, at the end of the webinar, we're setting some alerts here, you know, for the next day, you know, talking about how this is our rational self so that we're in the heat of the moment in the trading day. Um, we don't get all, you know, heaved out and, and nervous about making a trade. We just react because we've already planned for it. Now, on a day like today, you know, since the charts are kind of broken right now, we have to take a little bit different of an approach. Um, and so, you know, on 10 trades being up three and a half points mm -hmm. today, not, not, you know, I'll take it. I'll take it every day because, you know, uh, a day is a day. And whether I make three points on a slow day, three points on a crazy day, it's all the same to me. So, yeah, as, a, as I anticipated, people are curious about the volume radar you were working with there a minute ago. Can you maybe drop a copy of that into the chat window on the cloud feature so whoever's asking about that can receive that by uh, copying the link address and then loading from, from the cloud? Yeah. You'll have an exact copy of that right there. So just highlight your attention to the chat window. Uh, I've got my bio in there as well for those who are not curious or who are not, in, who are not uh knowing whom to, who's speaking right now, uh, that's myself, and then he just dropped in the cloud link for the volume uh, radar that he's been using. So there you go for the few people that were asking for that. Now, one thing to point out about this volume radar that you're seeing here, <clears throat> you'll notice the one-minute volume column up here. It does not reside in the top list in native format. It's in the alert window, but not the top list. So when you load up that window, you're only going to see 5 and 10 unless you have a one-minute volume custom filter. Now, anybody that does not have this one-minute volume filter, you can pop that email to info at trade-ideas.com, and it will get routed to the right person, whether it's myself, Steve, Marissa, Kelly, um, and we'll be happy to just post that right into your account um, so that you'll have it. So anybody that does not have the custom one-minute volume filter, in this case, it needs to be U99. Um, or if you've already used U99, then you'll just have to add it manually uh, by the traditional means. But if you don't have it at all, just email us, and we'll be happy to get that custom formula inserted into your account. Okay, so right. let's take a look at the time here. Let me take a look at my cheat sheet, make sure we're not uh, pushing the envelope here. So, yeah, we've still got uh, quite, a, quite a bit of time here. Um, so I hope that that kind of clarifies, you know, the difference between what we might call, for lack of a better term, a normal trading day versus the types of trading, day, trading days that we're experiencing now and how that does affect statistical probability. And quite frankly, I was surprised to see Holly do any trading today, but she managed to eke out a few trades based on the statistical probability which once again has a tremendous amount of noise in the stats right now due to the market being on unlimited shoe decks and on constant reshuffle. Yeah, I fully anticipate Holly to um, 
start showing up with a few more trades in the next few days because like we mentioned at the beginning of the hour, you know, the charts are broken and it's going to take a few days to really get that semblance back and find out where the equilibrium is before I think Holly starts to take on a lot more risk you know, rather than just a few trades a day. But, you know, time will tell, but I fully anticipate, you know, the volatility is here to stay uh, for at least a few more days. Um, yeah, and that's that. And, you know, with the chart that, uh, that I just pulled up here, of course, is the Holly performance chart. It's been updated today. We can see the negative 89 showing up there. But, you know, regardless, by, you know, basically sitting on hands, gap is getting wider between Holly and the S&P. S&P can't sit on hands. S&P does what S&P does, right? So, on the, um, you know, I like seeing the gap get wider. And eventually, when the market, for lack of a better term, normalizes, then this gap should increase. So, you know, as far as her performance since, well, we could just call it January since she came online on the very last day of, uh, the very last trading day of December, then we can just say January on, performing up to expectations, and now we've got this crazy volatility coming in. When will the markets normalize? I don't know. Could be tomorrow. Could be two weeks from now. Could be like this through the whole summer. There's just no way to know. But regardless of whether it's statistically noisy or gets normalized again, we'll have plenty of windows to keep us, you know, uh, to keep us in the good info. I'll quickly go over again the how to navigate volatility. Um, touched on it a bit in the intro and talk a little bit more about it because it's here and we see it, smell it, taste it, touch it, feel it. Um, you know, you got to wait for your pitch, the pitch that works best for you. But you know, some ideas to consider again. You can only control a couple things, uh, honestly. Everything else is out of your control. You can control your share size and you can control your attitude. And in these types of volatile markets, uh, Andy and I have talked about this over the years ad nauseum, um, downsizing your share size and going to more scaling in, scaling out really is a better way, in my opinion, to handle the volatility. Um, not only that, trying to look for levels of interest that are more contrary rather than um, chasing large green candles, maybe looking for a pullback and a setup and a level that makes sense. But in these volatile market environments, you've got to do your best to one, stay sane and two, stay solvent. And if that means sitting on your hands because you don't see your pitch, then sit on your hands. Cash can be a position. But if you have to trade, do it with lighter shares, scale in, scale out. Um, don't just throw it all on the come, you know, in and, and out. Let these things move around a little bit. But, uh, but be aware that um, smaller share size can work for you in more volatile environments because when you're managing your risk, it can also cut and hurt you a lot quicker as well. So, you know, just remember uh, you can control your entries and your exits and your share size and your attitude, but that's about it. Everything else is not in your control. So do what you can um, to try and maximize uh, the safe entries, the conservative entries, which I mean by pullbacks and levels of interest rather than breakouts. If the market's going to continue to have volatility to the downside, I don't anticipate a whole lot of breakouts to work. Maybe a couple of them will, but for the most part, uh, I don't see them working, and that's just the way it's always been. We've been conditioned in this market to either have a backdrop of buying the bid and, and up, up, uh, uptrending markets, higher lows, higher highs, or sideways type action, but it's been a while since we've seen some real downside volatility. And just be aware that um, you know it can cut you if you're not careful. So downsize, get small, scale in, scale out, and just do what you can to to manage your risk. Yeah, and the best way to do that is just to get a little bit of skin in the game. You know, whether it's 100 shares or or lower. You know, a long time ago, Steve, they wouldn't let us trade anything less than 100 shares back in the old days. That's changed quite a bit these days. Um, so you know, whatever, whatever your minimum share size might be, or your minimum dollar amount. You know, since a lot of people like to invest certain dollar amounts per trade. Well, that, that, that actually brings up a good a, a good follow-up, and I'm glad you brought that up uh, because um, what you don't want to do is say, well, the most I ever wanted to lose in a trade is $150, and here I am, and now i got to get out. What you really should have done is looked back at the beginning of the trade and found the level of, of, of uh, technical um, significance that would force you to exit the trade, and then 
then you calculate your shares to where that level actually works out to be the $150 that is your max loss or whatever your max loss is. For some people it might be 500 or or 1000 but the market doesn't care that you're down your max loss. What the market might care a little bit more about is where the footprints in the sand are in relation to a pivot level or a stop level. So again, first identify technically where your out is going to be and then you can calculate your shares to make that your max loss level because you know, like I said, the market doesn't care that you're down your max dollar amount. Uh, things are going to continue to go on without you. Yes, sir. And Steve, I'm glad I saw my alpha predator sitting down there because he got covered up and I almost forgot to talk about him. So, having said that, look, there's my name. I just need to put an O in there. <laughs> but that's not the reason I wanted to point out alpha predator. Alpha predator did some crazy things today. So here we are looking five minutes into the close, or excuse me, five minutes into the open, right? Central Standard Time. I'm just going to quickly scroll through these charts and we're going to notice correlation here. There's DXD. Okay, we see what it did right on the open. Here's my name without, without the O. Look what it did right off the open. SPXU. Hmm. SDS. Wow. Look at that. Drip. Off to the races. Now surely they can't all just go straight up. Okay, there's one. Remember that game? Uh, I think it was on the electric company. Which one of these things not like the other? Or uh -huh. was that? I can't remember. Which one of these things do not belong? Right, right, right. So, ABX, SPXS, FAZ, and gold. Only one didn't belong, only ABX. So what do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of nine that Alpha spit out in the first five minutes went straight up in a market that was getting absolutely hammered. And that's the window that's going to do it for you. That's uh, usually the window they're watching in the live trading room for the first 5, 10, 15 minutes to get an idea of uh, who the players might be for those big extended you know, first hour type runs. But even in, in a backdrop of market like today, you're correct. You know, there's always going to be something on that board more than likely is uh, uh, the money is running somewhere. Right, and so everybody's like, well, it's so scary in the, on the open. But, you know, if you wait for five minutes to pass and, you know, you're comfortable with the range and the first five-minute bar as being your exit, you know, here we go. The low of that bar was 1101. The low of this one was 1092. Ooh, big eight-cent risk. So, you know, a lot of these bars look scary, but when we start actually plowing into them, you know, there's some acceptable risk on the open you know, if you're thinking about taking some of these, but I, I'm just amazed, you know, at the performance of this little guy. Right off the open, eight out of nine. I mean, you're hard pressed to find anything like that, especially today. Yeah. So before, uh, let me just yeah, go ahead. There you and go. Mm -hmm. Because um, there are new people in here. We we talk about this alert a lot, but I uh, forget there are newcomers that come to our webinars and are just seeing this one for the first time. So. Definitely drop that cloud link in there. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> what else is there to say about good old Alpha Predator? You know, it is what it is and it just keeps on, keeps on keeping on. Um, I, I, every day I watch it and I'm like amazed. So if you haven't been taking advantage of this window, by all means, load it up, make it part of your default layout. Um, volume radar is also a good one to have, you know, and everybody needs to keep in mind, <clears throat> Once you start using a top list, which both of these are top lists, as I like to say all the time, your brain is a factory. Instead of making widgets, it makes ideas. The factory cannot make widgets unless it has a constant influx of raw material. Raw material in this case is information. The more you watch, the more you see these things and assimilate what's going on, you're feeding your brain raw material in the form of information. Therefore, the idea factory that is your brain can do its job and keep cranking out new stuff, things you've never thought of before. Once you start watching these windows, you're like, hmm, if I just added one more column 
to this top list, I get a lot more utility out of it. So having said that, let's just do this. I'm going to bump my record count. And we'll go ahead and bump it up to 600 here. And just to let everybody know what that means, that means that my filter set, which is very simple in this case because the, the good metrics are coming from these guys I've installed as columns, but just trying to keep the riffraff out with these metrics. So it's going to show me 600 stocks that meet this filter criteria. And then, for example, when the market closes, I like to resort by this column, consecutive days up or down. So no surprise to see there aren't a whole lot of stocks up 9, 10, 11, 12 days in a row. The top one here is 8. What about to the downside? Hmm. And that, that tells you something here. You know, shouldn't we have a lot of stocks that are down 9, 10, 11, 12 days in a row? You know, as they break through all these resistance levels and whatnot. So, you know, once again, what I thought was going to show up here, not necessarily the case. Typically, in a normalized market center, though, or market, there's always some, a handful of stocks being up 9, 10, 11, 12 days in a row, and vice versa. So really good way to develop a watch list for the next trading day. You know, just out of curiosity, AMH, you know, here we are. looks very similar to the uh, Snapple chart that we looked at. Snapple's not quite as, quite as advanced, but interestingly enough, something like this might be good to keep an eye on tomorrow just because it's up eight consecutive days in a row. But when you get up to the 10, 11, and 12, a little bit more interesting. All right, so Steve and I typically will go through the uh, trend change lubricant at the end of the webinar to... Yeah, slim pickings, though. ...some nice alerts for you guys and pass them out. But you hit the nail on the head, Steve. Slim Pickens, and not, I'm not talking about the musician. So I think there well, were only two that we came up with today, Steve. I, and I have maybe three. We'll just start with the one that's at the top of the list there. And I will point out it's a nice 37% short the float there, if you want to highlight that for everybody, that last column. All right. This well, yeah. is the interesting one on these trend change lubricants. If you look at that chart there, it kind of tells you the picture. Uh, the shorts might get squeezed above that pivot point. If I was a short seller, I would probably not want to take this trade back above that pivot point. Now, um, check it and check it in after hours. I think it might a little. It, you know what? It did pop up a little bit there in after hours, but came back. So we should be able to set that alert right above today's close, or maybe we should just put it above. Yeah, above today's close there. So where is that? Uh, Thirty-five. Actually, pop, Steve. It actually popped in the last five minutes. That's that's post market. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, let's it let's mark that post market. Yeah. Let's mark it up for for continuation tomorrow if it can make a new penny high. You know, uh, it's just just peeking its head above there. And again, you know, if we have a negative backdrop in the market tomorrow, these types of situations may not follow through, but it's still worth bringing to our attention. Uh, so you want to use the you have penny past the high of today, correct? Yeah, penny past the high of today's close. So I I use the daily chart really just to make sure. Yeah. Let me let me double. We got the right. Five twenty six. Should be the, the the mark, yep. Okay, so we'll set that one again. Identifying a nice pivot level there uh, on the trend change lubricant, um, but on the long side there, highlighting the the top list by short float and having the biggest short floaters come to the top, and it's worth putting in the notes so you remind yourself 37% short the float because when this thing pops back up, you might not really remember it, but it might look like a great you know great setup in real time, the more information we can give our future self, the better. So that one's set. Okay. And that is a map, uh, you know, we're looking at mattresses here. <laughs> nice defensive that, play. How did that SAM look? Did, did that not look that well? I mean, it's got a decent short float on the uh, trend change. Well, I thought it was the SAM. Of course, this is a beer company. Mattresses and beer um, seem to be the theme today. So. Yeah. That if we back to too. You know, prior uh, Big pivot, support. prior support, becoming current resistance, that is the anatomy of a pivot point. And if we can get through that pivot, there's a little bit of a gap up there, a bit of a void. So I think we do want to mark this one up. And we can see it barely poked its head above, very similar to what uh, 
uh, MFRM did today, but once again, it's it's poking back down in the uh, post market. So we'll just use the high of today, correct? Yep, correct. We're looking at 164.50. Rises, um, not that big of a. I don't think we had a. It's there. Big of a it was twenty something. I, th I thought it was twenty something. Take a look at it. Yeah, let me. Uh, a lot of getting locked up here. Doesn't want to let me have that window. Yeah. Okay, it's so. Two percent. Yeah, still not too shabby. Yeah, so we can remind ourselves that. It, uh, yep. Wouldn't hurt. So once again, one sixty four fifty. Twenty-two percent short on the trend change lubricant. Okay, rises two. We're gonna go long. Click that, and then voila. And you know, usually there's a lot more, um, but once again, everything's out of whack. Yeah. And, you know, let me just show everybody this as well, Steve. We were like, well, maybe there's some materializing. Those are good setups to the top. But what we'll find out as we cycle through these guys, they haven't been up there trudging along near long enough. You know, and a lot of them have already went. You know, this is the closest thing I've seen to a real setup up here. Um, but you know, Friday it gapped down and continued. So, you know, either there's can't chase they're not that free and there's no chasing. So in other words, these guys just are not ripe enough yet. There will come a day where we see the exact opposite pattern, you know, to the downside. But that time has not arrived yet. And who knows? Maybe we'll never see it at the top. Maybe we'll have to go down and then consolidate. So I actually did have NVIDIA. Go one more because I did have NVIDIA. If we go one more, we might be able to see a short set up there on your TCL. NVIDIA? Yeah, it was, it was the next one you were going to hit there on the TCL. Yeah, um, NVIDIA. That one we, we could make a, a case for because it's kind of a narrow range. It's popping back up. It, it could jig around a little bit, but if it breaks that doji that it put in today, there's uh, room to fall. So it may be worth it because I had this one written down. I think we may want to uh, pull back. Well, um, we could look to do a bounce, a bounce, yeah, a, a bounce alert, or we could just mark that up and say if it takes out today's low again, uh, there may be some follow through. That was right, or we, or, or we could just set up a good old bracket, right? Yeah, that too, so, either way. Um, if we took below that bar, 44.56. Like Jamie said, there's been a lot of sideways action. That's what we're looking for. And this one hasn't gotten too far away below that sideways action. The ones that were prior to this chart had a lot of big red hot dog, long red candles. And we don't want to chase candles. We'd like to see something beginning to slowly break down out of its range. So and we could say 4659 if it rises, we want to go short. TV fill. And of course, one hits, you just remove the other one or leave it, you know, in case uh, there's additional action. But whether it pops up, we're going to get filled, or whether it pops down, we're going to get filled. So another way, just another way to skin the cat. That's all I had for uh, for markups. Uh, again, not a whole lot of slim pickings. So before I forget, let me just take these two. Uh, oops, I'm looking at the wrong window here. Where did my where did she go? Okay. As soon as I find my window, and there it is, hiding below my toolbar. And for some reason, <laughs> my toolbar is covering up my, uh, all right, well, how do we move this guy? There we go. I get forceful with it. Okay. So all we had today was the... Well, it's hard because you don't have a set column to see yeah, how to sort my I'm set. Still whack here. There we go. Okay, so we had uh, MFRM, SAM, and NVIDIA. Those are the only ones today. Okay. He'll drop those into the chat window for those that have price alert functionality and wanted to log these as well. Um, just use the cloud and load from the cloud on that price alert link. It'll drop them directly into your price alerts and add them to what you currently have going. 
All right. Well, once again, I want to just thank everybody for popping in and hearing what Steve and I have to say. Hopefully, uh, you'll find this information useful, and uh, you know, whether you apply it tomorrow or the next day, or just get used to the methodology that we're uh, uh, we're putting in front of you guys here today. Uh, just keep on coming to these webinars, keep practicing, and eventually you'll start to see things take take shape. Um, Steve, if you don't have anything else to add, I think we'll let Scott come in and. Good. Talk to the people about uh, pricing and discount codes and things of that nature. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, we can go ahead and put that slide up with the price schedule on it. Sure. People can go to tradeideas.com slash price uh, to go ahead and get to that pricing grid and make a purchase. And if you use that code office hours all caps, that takes 15% off your order total right away. So you could start your first year at 15% off or your first month at 15% off. So we have regular Trade Ideas Pro and Trade Ideas Premium. Uh, the major difference there is access to the back testing tool, Holly the AI, and uh, the price alerts and the art red red green, uh, red bar ignore green bar ignore stuff. Uh, so the regular version is 99 is 99 a month or 888 per year. Uh, obviously, the yearly saves you quite a bundle. Same thing with the premium. It's 188 per month or 1888 per year. Again, use that code. Get 15% off. Uh, we'll send you an email with a reminder about this and a link to the recording um, probably tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, thank you for joining us. Make sure you go to the trading room also. That uh, live trading room is free and it's available every day. Contact us. You can follow Dan at Trade Ideas 1. Follow Steve at Today Trader. Follow Jamie at QuantBot. Uh, we post some different stuff to Facebook, so facebook.com slash tradeideaspro is how you find us there. You can email Steve or, J or Jamie directly, or uh, shoot an email to info at trade-ideas.com with any support questions, if you have something general. And the phone number is good for billing issues during normal business hours. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jamie. Um, we will uh, stop the recording and get this converted. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. All right. See you.